Hello, you're welcome to another exciting edition of this um, Bible study program. Yes, today we are going to be talking about uh, the topic of baptism. Is baptism necessary to salvation? My name is Osamagwe Leslie Igariva, and uh, uh, today I have with me a, a very sound uh, brother in Christ, a very good friend, uh, uh, Brother Pat uh, Donahue uh, from Alabama, United States. Uh, Brother Pat, can you, can you say hi and introduce yourself? Leslie, I really appreciate you doing programs like this to try to reach people with the truth. I mean, I already have appreciation from you from afar because we've never actually got to meet face to face, but I have appreciation for you afar based upon your magazine and how you're willing to defend what you believe. I mean, a lot of preachers, they want to preach things publicly, but they won't defend what they preach publicly. They won't defend it publicly. You're willing to do that. That's exactly what Jesus and Paul were willing to do. I've got a lot of appreciation for your courage in doing that. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. Um, um, it's great. And then where are you talking from? Where exactly are you talking from? Uh, your location? Now, I live in Alabama, in the United States, of course, near Huntsville, Alabama. Oh, okay. People may have heard of Huntsville, Alabama. A lot of the NASA stuff is there, you know, trying to get to the moon and trying to get to space. So I live near Huntsville, Alabama, in the United States. Oh, great, great. Well, I'm in a very small place in Nigeria, Lagos. Thank you. Um, so we want to talk about baptism. Uh, baptism is a topic that is discussed in the Bible. Uh, but the issue we have now is that there are lots of um, views on baptism. Some people think, you know, it's just an outward sign of an inward um, grace or something like that. A lot of persons, some people think, well, you, you, you have to be baptized for the forgiveness of, of your sins. And, um, you know, the, the, the meaning of baptism for the forgiveness of sins has actually taken a lot of uh, uh, interpretation. Some think, think, well, you are baptized because you have your sins forgiven. And some th thinks that, oh, no, you, you are baptized because uh, you, uh, in order for you to have your sins forgiven. So what's your take on that before we go into the text that, that speaks on baptism? Well, Leslie, you're really already referring to Acts 2.38, where Peter told believers to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, you've debated Baptists, and I certainly, I must have done the baptism uh, is necessary debate with it probably 20 times publicly. And the Baptists will always say that for the remission of sins, there means because of the remission of sins. Okay. Now, our English word, Leslie, for can mean because of in okay. football. You get six points for a touchdown because of a touchdown. But this word in the Greek is ace. It never is translated or means because of. It always points forward. So if you're just arguing from the English, I can see that how they might have a point, a point. But when you understand the Greek ace, it always points forward. And here's another way that we can tell that it's pointing forward here. Because every Baptist I've ever debated, Leslie, it's probably okay. been 20 of them. They mm. all understand that repentance must be done in order to get the remission of sins. That you okay. can't get the remission of sins without repentance. Well, whatever for ace means here, it means the same thing for baptism as it does for repentance. Okay. If, if it's baptized because of the remission of sins, then that would mean you repent because of the remission of sins. But every Baptist knows that means you repent in order to get the remission of sins. So likewise, it would have to mean you're baptized in order to get the remission of sins and to get the gift of the Holy Ghost. Mm, great point. So basically you're saying repentance for the forgiveness of sins means uh, you have to repent first before baptism and then baptism for uh, before uh, forgiveness of sin, I beg your pardon. And then uh, baptism for the forgiveness of sins actually means you have to be baptized first before you get the forgiveness uh, of sins. Okay, good. Now, now I, I would like to throw a question to you. I was I was reading an argument, and someone says, "Well, uh, you're taking aspirin for headache doesn't necessarily mean you're taking aspirin because uh, you want to have headache, or you're taking aspirin because you already have headache." Uh, what can you say to that argument? Uh, they well, try to create the parallel. Okay, I just used the same illustration. In football, you get six points for a touchdown, meaning because of. So yeah. that's the same argument. They're using a sense, they're using the word for in the sense of because of. And we agree the English word for can mean because of. But as I've already pointed out, if you go back to the Greek here, it's ace. And ace never means because of. It always yeah. points forward. Okay. okay. 
Okay. Do you think that Matthew chapter 28 verse two, uh, uh, Matthew chapter 26 verse 28 uh, is a good passage to be brought in here? I think in that passage, Jesus Christ was talking and then we have a similar construction. You know, Jesus was saying, my blood, this is my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then we have similar expression in Acts 2, 38, uh, my blood uh, uh, baptized for the forgiveness of sins. So I'm thinking if, if one says that baptism is because one has received the forgiveness of sins, then you would, such should argue that the blood of Christ is because one has received the forgiveness of sins. What, what do you think about that? Leslie, I think that's a super parallel to Acts 2.38, to compare it to Matthew 26.28, because they're exactly the same in the Greek and in the English. All right. One says we're baptized for the remission of sins. The other says Jesus' blood is shed for the remission of sins. And no Baptist thinks his blood was shed because of the remission mm. of sins. Exactly. They all believe that it means that his blood was shed in order to obtain the remission, remission of sins. And Acts 2.38 is the same in the Greek and the English. You're making a super point. It shows, illustrates that Acts 2.38 is saying to be baptized for the remission of sins in the sense of in order to obtain. Just like for the remission of sins in Matthew 26.28, the Baptist will admit it means in order to obtain. Great parallel, Leslie. Okay, thank you. I just want to be sure... Um... I'm making some sense. Thank you for, for that. All right, let's move to Mark chapter 16, verse 16. You know, that's another passage that, you know, I've quoted a passage for, you know, to a lot of people. And, you know, they keep telling me, well, Jesus said, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He didn't say, he who does not believe and is not baptized shall be saved. So he only says, he who does not believe shall be condemned. So what do you have to say to that? Since Jesus didn't say, if you are not baptized, you will be condemned. So can you say something on that? Yeah, first of all, the first part of the verse, Jesus tells us what a person has to do to be saved. Okay. Believe and be baptized. That's simple. I, I usually say most of the Bible is written on a sixth grade level. This is really on a third grade level. It's so simple. You have to believe and be baptized if you want to be saved. The second part of the verse, he that believeth not shall be condemned, is telling you all that you have to do in order to be lost. And Leslie, it doesn't really make any sense for Jesus to have said he that belie believeth not and is baptized not shall be condemned because you can't be baptized scripturally unless you believe first. We know that from passages like Acts 8, 35 through 37, where the eunuch wanted to be baptized. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may be baptized. You have to believe first before you can be baptized. And so it wouldn't make any sense for Jesus to mention baptism in the second part, because if you don't believe, you're going to be condemned, and if you don't believe, you can't be baptized scripturally. That's why Jesus doesn't mention baptism in the second part. The second part tells you all you have to do to be lost is disbelief. The first part is what tells you what you have to do to be saved, and it clearly says you have to believe and be baptized to be saved. That's just what Jesus says about it, and if we say that's not really true, we're calling Jesus a liar. So basically, you're saying that it takes two things to be saved. And then it takes one thing to be damned. All right. Exactly. All right. So I have one more question for you on that because I, I've, I've actually read a couple of debates on, on baptism. And like you said, you've debated a couple of them. You said 20, 20 of them, am I correct? Okay. I think right. about 20. About 20, okay, about 20 of them. So that means, you know, uh, uh, Benjamin Bogart, he was a, a great Baptist debater, in my opinion. Like he debated a lot of our brethren. And I think, uh, you know, he also believes that baptism is not necessary for the forgiveness of sins. And he made a, a supposed a parallel statement uh, to uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 16. And this is the statement. It says, he who enters the vehicle and sits down shall get to Little Rock. Little Rock is a place in Arkansas in the United States. So he is saying that he who enters the vehicle and sits down, we get to Little Rock. And so what is required in that command is that you need to get into the vehicle, whether or not you are seated, you would get to literal. So uh, similarly, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. What is important is for you to get to believe whether or not you're baptized, you get salvation. So what do you have to say to that argument? Okay, so Mr. Bogard, yes, I know about him. His illustration is he that gets in the vehicle and sits down will get to their destination, right? Yeah. If he said that to me, I would say, Mr. Bogart, that's an inaccurate statement. Mm. You don't have to sit down. 
to get to your destination. And what you said implies that you do. If you say he that gets in the vehicle and sits down will get to their destination, that really implies you have to sit down to get to your destination. But we all don't know, based upon circumstance and situation, that that's not true. So I'd say, Mr. Bogart, that's an inaccurate or false statement. A person doesn't have to sit down in order to get to their des destination. You see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. when Jesus said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, that's an accurate statement. That's not a false statement. So it implies you have to both believe and be baptized to be saved. Stating an inaccurate statement, a false statement as an illustration doesn't prove anything. Mm. Okay. You see that what I mean, Les? How that's an inaccurate statement? It doesn't really state the truth. Yeah. Say, hey, he that gets in the vehicle and sits down will get to their destination because that implies something that's false, that you have to sit down to get, get there, and you don't. So do you think this is an accurate statement? He who eats his food and digests it shall live, but he who does not eat his food shall die. Exactly. I think that's a lot more parallel than Ben Bogart's illustration. You have okay. to, according to that, you have to eat your food and digest it in okay. order to live. Take both. Hey, and Leslie, and I like that illustration because it helps to illustrate the second part of the verse too. You okay. can say he that eat, digests his food will live, but he that eateth not shall die because it doesn't make any sense to be talking about digestion. Mm, if you don't eat so you got so the only thing that's going to cause you to, to, to lose your life physically is if you don't eat. It doesn't make any sense to say he that does not eat and he that does not digest shall die because you can't digest unless you eat. It's the same way with baptism. You can't be baptized scripturally unless you eat believe first. So I like your illustration. I think it okay. fits Mark 16, 16 very well. Okay, so summarily, Mark 16, 16 says that a person has to do both believing and baptism uh baptizing a bigger pardon before he gets uh, salvation okay that, that makes sense so let's go let me, let me finish that real quick your summary there okay the baptist will debate they all understand that if a person is baptized without believing like maybe somehow he got baptized as a baby which i would of course not even think the scriptural baptist but if he gets baptized as a baby and he never grows up to believe the baptist would say he's not going to be saved because he doesn't believe He's only done one out of the two things in Mark 16, 16. Well, why can't they see the other thing, too, that if you leave off belief, it'll cause you to be lost. If you leave off baptism, it'll cause you to be lost. Jesus is requiring both. Great point. Great point. Thank you. So I, I think I, I'm done with the questioning on that particular verse uh, passage. I, I would like us to move over to Acts 22, verse 16. Now, this is another passage that um, talks about baptism. And that, that place says, if you read, it says, um, you know, I think Paul was talking. He says he was giving his uh, conversion and he said, and now Ananias said to him, and now why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Now, what relevance is this passage to baptism for the forgiveness of sins? Uh, can you say something on that? Leslie, as you know, you can read Acts 9, Acts 22, Acts 26. All of those three of those chapters give the conversion account of Saul of Tarsus, later became known as Saul the Apostle. Okay. If that conversion account is in the book of Acts three times, it must be pretty important. Hmm. And in all three of those accounts, we see Jesus appearing to, G to Paul on the road to Damascus. He says something like, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, Saul understands it's a voice from heaven. So he knows it's the Lord, but he doesn't know who the Lord is. So he says, who art thou, Lord? He says, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Paul says, what will you have me to do? So obviously, Paul believes in Jesus at that point. What will you have me to do? In the meantime, Jesus sends Ananias to Paul to tell him what to do. And that's where Acts twenty two sixteen 16 comes in. Ananias tells Saul to arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name the Lord. Now, it's the standard position of the Baptist that a person is saved from their sins. Their sins are washed away by the blood of Christ when they believe. So they'll say, oh, Saul was saved on the road to Damascus. But how could that be true, Leslie, as you know, because Ananias is telling Saul three, at least three days later, after he believes in Jesus on the road to Damascus, to do something to get his sins washed away. So obviously, Saul wasn't saved at the point of belief by faith only, but three days later, he's told to do something to get his sins washed away. Well, what is he told to do? To be baptized. Leslie, we're all agreed 
that it's the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. Now, but the, question, the question is, when does it do it? Mm. Well, the conversion of Saul lets us know exactly when. The blood of Christ did not wash away his sins when he believed on the road to Damascus. But the blood of Christ washed away his sins three days later after he believed, mm. when he was baptized. So that, again, proves that baptism is necessary to salvation from sin. Great point. So basically, the, the time that um, a person spiritually have access to the blood of Christ is at a point that he is dipped in water uh, in the authority of Christ and is raised to walk in the inner supply. Uh, I don't know, in, in the Old Testament, uh, uh, a man called Amon was asked to dip himself in the water seven times to you know, get his sickness off him. Would that be a good uh, uh, allusion to say, well, at the point of obedience to that command, by dipping himself, like you said, it's not the water per se, but the blood of Christ. However, the obedience is necessary. If Neman had refused to dip himself, you know, I, I'm not sure he would get the healing. But at the point of obedience is when the healing takes place. I, I don't know if I'm correct to make that uh, conclusion. I, I like that illustration from 2 Kings 5 and Naaman being asked to dip. Because you see from that story there that that God asked Naaman to dip seven times, as you mentioned, and his leprosy would be cleansed. Now, when he dipped in that water in the Jordan River, it's not like there was a bunch of medicine flowing mm. around in the water that healed mm. him. No, Naaman didn't heal himself. God healed him when Naaman told, when Naaman did what God told him to do to be healed of his leprosy. So here's the parallel. It's not really the water that saves us. It's not the water that washes away our sins. There's nothing magical in, in the waters of water baptism. It's the blood of Christ that washes away our sins. But when we do what God tells us to do in order to get our sins washed away, and in this case, it be baptized and wash away thy sins, when we do that, then God washes away our sins, just like when Naaman dipped in the Jordan River seven times, God cleansed him of his leprosy. I like the parallel there. Thank you. So what do we call the teaching that water washes away sins? I mean, the water itself, is it baptismal regeneration? Is that correct? Some people call it that. And when they call it that, I don't like to use that term because I want to be emphatic that it's not the water mm. that washes away our sins. Revelation 1.5 says the blood of Christ washes away our sins. It's water baptism is when the blood of Christ washes away our sins. It was sins. It's a different thing. It's not what we do that saves us. Even our belief is not what earns our salvation. The death mm. of Christ is what earns it. Belief and baptism are just conditions we have to meet in order to be saved by the death of Christ. Okay. All right. Uh, Brother Pat, I, I have one question for you on Galatians chapter 3, verse uh, 26 uh, and 27. Uh, that passage says, for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus, for as many of you as were baptized into Christ are put on Christ. Now, I understand that the Greek word for in that text, verse 27, is the word God, G-A-R, am I correct? Good. I now, so. um, what is it trying to say? Are we baptized into Christ to put on Christ? Or what is the relevance? Or what can you say? That uh, can you prove from this passage that baptism has anything to do with, 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 with our salvation or the forgiveness of sins? You know, about five minutes ago, Leslie, you mentioned something like this. You said baptism is where we contact the blood. I think you said mm. something like that. Yes. And that's really what this verse in verse 27 is saying when it says you're baptized in the Christ. That would mean that before you're baptized, you're not in Christ. You haven't contacted the blood. Baptism is where you contact the blood. But you notice verse 26, Leslie says, you're all the children of God by faith, okay? Mm. We're all agreed that we become children of God by faith. But this little word for, gar in the Greek, means to introduce the reason. The reason. Okay. So what it's saying is you're a child of God by faith, and the reason you're a child of God by faith is because you have been baptized into Christ. In other words, the way you became a child of God by faith is by being baptized into Christ. So I, I suggest, again, just like you said, this is another verse that teaches you have to be baptized to, to get into Christ, to get in a saved relationship with Christ. You can't be saved. You can't become a child of God by faith without being baptized, according to this verse. 
Okay, so Brother Pat, the word for here is different from the word for in Act 2, uh, 38, that says for the forgiveness of sins and for as many as we baptize. They are, they are two different words. Okay, so yeah. basic, basically this one is introducing the reason why we are sons of God by faith. And the reason is because we have been baptized and we have uh, that baptism uh, makes us uh, put on uh, Christ. Correct? Exactly. Different okay. words. Okay, final question, Brother Pat. I want us to look at it, the thief on the cross. <laughs> the thief on the cross was not baptized. And uh, he, he, Jesus told him, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. <laughs> How can you have a man who has not been baptized? And yet we have people baptizing. We have John baptizing. We have the disciples of Christ baptizing. Yet he was not baptized. And Jesus says, hey, you come with me. You'll be with me in paradise. Please, can you uh, say something on that? Yeah. This comes up on my Bible Crossfire radio program all the time. That's it. the most asked question. And there's a lot of things I could say about the thief on the cross. But the first passage I usually turn to is Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. It says, for this cause he, talking about Christ, is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testament. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testament is living. Now, the writer of Hebrews is illustrating from this fact. My parents, Leslie, Ken and Janine Donahue, wrote their, the wills, their wills in, in the 1970s. Yeah. Four of us boys. Okay? All four of us boys are supposed to split the possessions evenly. But they, the will that they wrote in the 1970s didn't go into effect until after both of them had passed away. My dad in 2001, my mother in 2010. Mm -hmm. Now, the writer here is saying it's the same thing is true about Jesus's testament, his New Testament, the New Testament law, the law of Christ. It didn't go into effect until after the death of the testator, Jesus Christ. The thief didn't have to be baptized, Leslie. Because he lived under the Old Testament law. The new law didn't go into effect until after the death of Jesus. Actually, we know from Luke 24, 47, it went into effect beginning on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Okay? Yeah. The, so, therefore, the thief didn't have to be baptized to be saved for the same reason Adam and Eve didn't have to be baptized, or Moses didn't have to be baptized, or Abraham or Noah didn't have to be baptized. Because the law they lived under did not require them to be baptized. But the New Testament law, the law of Christ, beginning with Mark 16, 16, and some of these passages you mentioned, and one other, if we have time to get to it, 1 Peter 3, 21, it proves that you have to be baptized to be saved. That's New Testament law, which the thief never lived under less. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that, that, that answers my question. But we, I, I have one more follow-up question from your response. We have five minutes, and let's see if we can take that question. Now... Okay. You said the testament is not in force until after you didn't say so. Actually, Bible says so. So you quoted that. So um, you you're saying basically that it is after the death of the testator that the testament comes into force. Now, who died first, the thief on the cross or Jesus Christ? I think if you look at the account, you will see that when they came, they discovered that Christ was already dead, and then because they want, wanted to extinguish their death, they discovered Christ uh, had already died. And so they did not break his bones. So the other two, you know, the thief shows that they were still alive. In other words, Christ died before them. So if Christ died first before the two thief, two thief from the cross, um, then don't you think the testament should be enforced immediately after his death? And then the thief on the cross should be under the new covenant and should have been baptized. That's my question. If you can answer that in, in the next three minutes. <laughs> Good question. You notice? That Hebrews 9 says the testament is a force after men are dead, not mm -hmm. at the point of when my when my mother died in 2010, that her will did not go into effect at that moment when she died. It went into effect later when it was probated. So the, it's not saying in Hebrews 9 that Jesus's New Testament went into effect at his death, but after his death, sometime after his death. And as I said, Luke 24, 47 says, repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. 
So that's telling us when this New Testament law that requires baptism went into effect. It was to go into effect, start being binding in Jerusalem, meaning Acts 2, the first day of Pentecost, about 40 to 50 days after Jesus' death. The thief was forgiven long before the New Testament law went into effect, the law that requires baptism. Okay, so basically... He was forgiven while Jesus was still alive, Leslie, right? Okay, so basically, I like the points you make on the fact that not at the point of the death of the individual. Basically, when a man falls down, for instance, and dies, you know, the, the, the first thing that comes to people's mind is how he's going to be carried and buried or something like that, not the will he has given, given up. And so basically, you're saying that, you know, the, the death of Christ before the thief on the cross really doesn't prove anything. Uh, to support the, 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 the doctrine that baptism has nothing to do with uh, salvation because the thief on the cross was not baptized, right? Yeah, the thief on the cross was forgiven before Jesus died. And before he died. The will of Christ did not go into effect until about 50 days after the After. Mm, that's great. On, that's the, great. And actually on the first day of Pentecost. Okay, that, that's a great point, Brother uh, Pat. And those are the questions I have for you. I don't know, before we close, do you have any word for people, you know, because a lot of people believe that baptism is not necessary. And, you know, they, they teach this with much um, ardor. They say, well, just believe, believe in Jesus Christ. So what do you have to say to them in the next one minute? So uh, before we go. <laughs> well, I'd like to mention that verse that we didn't have time for, First Peter 3, 21, which says... Also Baptism doth also now save us. Now, Leslie, would God say baptism okay. saves us if you didn't have to be baptized to be saved? Would he say that? He wouldn't, would he? Say that again? You said? Would, would God say baptism saves us in 1 Peter 3, 21 if we didn't have to be baptized? Oh, no, no, no. He wouldn't say that. So basically, if baptism saves us, it means, of course, that we have to be baptized to get saved. That, that's what they say. What passage is that again? Please remind me so people can hear uh, the passage over and over again. First Peter, First Peter 3, 21. First Peter, oh, First 3, Peter 21. 3, verse 21. Okay. Now, when it says baptism saves us, Leslie, it's not saying that baptism earns our salvation. Okay. Not, no, the death of Christ earns it. It's saying that it's, baptism is a condition we have to meet in order to be saved by the death of Christ. That's what it's saying. Okay. But he wouldn't say that if you didn't have to be baptized to be saved. Okay, so in other words, First Peter is a, is, a, is a killing blow to that doctrine that baptism uh, doesn't save, because bapti uh, that passage actually says baptism saves us. You know, the KJV has it, baptism doth also now save us. And you know, so, you know what, if you remove the word N-O-W in that sentence, baptism doth also now saves us, and you remove the W, and you replace it with a T, the letter T, it, it changes the meaning. You know, we now have, instead of baptism dot also now save us, we now have baptism dot also not save us. So that's exactly what the people are teaching today. Did, did you get my point? Yeah. Absolutely, right. So, so, yeah, thank you so much, Brother Pat. I really do appreciate your time and the effort you have put into the uh, explaining these passages. I believe that people who are teaching this uh, false doctrine would have a rethink. And then hopefully I would have you back here soon to talk about some other topic. I really do appreciate it. And I, I, I like the fact that you give your time and uh, energy to this uh, for this discussion. And also, I thank you for your encouragement. Yes, I'm learning from you. Uh, you're a great debater, in my opinion. You've debated a lot of people. How many debates have you had? Like. Can you give in total? I don't know, but it's 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 somewhere probably over a hundred. Oh, over a hundred! Oh my God! So, <laughs> that's that's a great one. All right, thank you so much. Uh, uh, we'll, that will be all for now, and I'll talk to you uh, again. Thank you for the opportunity, Leslie. I enjoy talking about the Bible anytime. All right.